The spring of 1943 found me in Moscow as assistant chief of the main naval staff. At the same time, I was editing the oldest magazine marine collection. The work was interesting, creative. But the proverb is true no matter how much you feed the wolf, he keeps looking into the forest. I longed for the sea for real combat service. On May 6th, late at night, there was a phone call. I picked up the phone and heard an unfamiliar stern voice. Rear Admiral Pantaleev. Yes, it's me, I answer quietly. You should arrive at the Kremlin. The car will be at your house in 20 minutes. And a click in the receiver. I agonise. Why do they call me an even so late? But there's nothing to do. I hurriedly get ready. Both my wife and my old father are awake, asking what's wrong. What could I say to them? I barely had time to get dressed when the bell rang in the hallway. I opened the door. A tall, neat major in the uniform of the NKVD troops saluted me. The car is waiting. A trip through the night city of the war era has little appeal. The streets are dark, no lights, no living soul. Only with a rumble passing oncoming military vehicles. The major is silent, I am silent too. We passed Arbat, Red Square, a little slowed down in the Spassky gates of the Kremlin and further. We stopped at a dark entrance. I walk through the poorly lit lobby, climb the stairs. The large reception room is flooded with bright light. After the darkness of the night, it cuts my eyes. Two lieutenant colonels are sitting at a table with many telephones, talking quietly. One of them indifferently throws me. Sit down, please. I waited for a long time, even very long. Finally, I was summoned. I entered a vast room. Behind a long bare table covered with a green tablecloth sat people, many of whom I knew only from their portraits members of the Politburo, commissars. I must admit that I was a little confused. There was a lonely chair against the wall. Someone pointed it out to me. Sit down, comrade. I sat down. The tall, slender people's commissar of the Navy, NG. Kuznetsov, with his hands behind his back, silently stopped not far from me. Apparently a serious and important conversation was taking place here. Everyone's faces were tired and gloomy. The silence was broken by AI. Mikoyan. Comrade Pantelayev, have you ever sailed on the Volga? No, Anastas Ivanovich, I haven't. Mikoyan smiled. Didn't you take a ride on the Volga even once on vacation? No, I have not been on vacation, and I have not ridden on steamships. There was a long pause. The eyes of all looked at Kuznetsov. He blushed slightly, went to his chair, took his hands on the backrest. I have already reported to Comrade Stalin that I have no specialist river boatman, but any military sailor must cope on the river. That's why I suggested the candidacy of Rear Admiral Pantelayev. He fell silent. The other participants of the meeting were exchanging opinions in a low voice. A few minutes later, Kuznetsov and I were in the car. Dawn was already breaking. The commissar, who sat in front with the chauffeur, slightly turned to me and asked, Comrade Pantelayev, did you understand everything? No, I didn't understand anything I admitted. Only in the commissar's office everything became clearer, the admiral asked me. What do you know about the Volga flotilla? I replied that I had heard a lot about the heroism of its sailors in the battles for Stalingrad. Yes, they really fought valiantly then. But when our troops drove the fascists away from the banks of the Volga, they calmed down. And we here in Moscow weakened attention to the flotilla. And Hitlerites appreciated the importance of the Volga as a strategic communication better than we did. The commissar silently walked along the table and continued with obvious irritation now. With the beginning of navigation, our ships, one after another, began to be blown up by enemy mines, including barges with oil products. For several days, the whole river was burning for dozens of kilometres. And this is at a time when our troops are preparing for a general offensive along the entire front, when tanks, airplanes, ships of the fleet will need a lot of liquid fuel. The admiral sank into his chair. Comrade Stalin is upset and alarmed. At his suggestion, the leadership of the flotilla is changed. 
You are appointed flotilla commander. Turn in here, tomorrow you and I will fly to Stalingrad. In the morning of May 8th, we left Moscow in a special plane, under the cover of fighters. The People's Commissar of the River Fleet 3.A. Shashkov flew with us. He and NG. Kuznetsov all the way talked about the upcoming cases. The airplane chattered a lot, and although I was used to the rocking, but here it was not like at sea, to distract myself somehow I looked out the window. A muddy blue ribbon appeared below. Is this the Volga? Where can ships sail here? The airplane landed. The wind carried clouds of fine red dust over the airfield on the outskirts of the city. It flew from the ruins. The city didn't exist. Where once there had been factories and dwellings, there were charred iron skeletons and piles of bricks. Here, too, one could see broken, overturned guns. We arrived at a large debarcader, a floating wharf. In one of its halls, the meeting began. Responsible workers of the Regional Party Committee and Regional Executive Committee, heads of steamship companies and technical services of the river fleet were present. The situation on the river reported the commander of the Volga flotilla, Rear Admiral D. D. Rogachev. He began with complaints that the flotilla has few minesweepers, that the heads of shipping companies ignore the proposals of the military, tugboat captains violate the navigation instructions. As a result, a barge with oil products exploded again yesterday. One of the rivermen made a remark. What barge is there 16,000 tonnes of oil products are burning on the water? And then almost everyone started talking and making noise. Yes, I thought, the rivermen and the military still had not found a common language. The first secretary of the regional committee, A.S. Chuyanov angrily tapped his pencil on the table. Quiet, comrades. We are not here to exchange reproaches. We need to urgently outline a plan of action to continue to work hand in hand. Admiral N.G. Kuznetsov took the floor. He informed that, by the decision of the government from now on, all Volga shipping companies with all services are transferred to the operational subordination of the flotilla commander, on whom the State Defence Committee assigns all responsibility for transportation on the Volga. Then the People's Commissar of the Navy named the number of river vessels, which together with their crews should be immediately transferred to the flotilla. They would be converted into warships. People's Commissar of the River Fleet 3.A Shashkov immediately gave appropriate instructions to his subordinates. Some rivermen frowned unhappily the innovations were clearly not to their liking, but many rejoiced realising how important it is in wartime to concentrate all power in one hand. At the end of the meeting, People's Commissar of the Navy introduced me as the new commander of the flotilla. Yes, here's something else, comrades, he added. The government has given the flotilla commander the right on behalf of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet to award orders and medals, not only to the military, but also to rivermen who have distinguished themselves in the performance of tasks of the command. He could award any citizen who would at least indicate the place where the mine had fallen. This news caused general excitement. There were cheers. That's right. Balm. A necessary useful thing. It's high time. We were accommodated on a large seaboat BMK-1. It was a navigable ship with good anti-aircraft armament, modern means of communication, with several very cosy cabins, and quite capacious, finished in mahogany cabin compartment, where 10 to 12 people could sit at the table. I immediately liked this ship and decided to move my campaign headquarters to it. The flotilla headquarters at that time was travelling by ship from Ulyanovsk, where it was stationed in the winter. Rogachev to Stalingrad arrived by airplane. All evening the People's Commissar questioned him about the state of the flotilla, the situation on the river. The enemy mines the river every day. At Kamini Yar the fairway had to be temporarily closed. There accumulated 40 barges with oil products that's 30,000 tonnes of fuel. And on other sections the caravans are moving at the speed of a turtle. The journey from Astrakhan to Saratov takes up to 22 days instead of nine days in former times. The commissar listened attentively. At the end of the conversation he turned to me. Remember, comrade Pantyayev, each oil barge is assigned to a certain front. They are waiting for it there. Is it clear? 
clear, I answered. But one thing is to understand the task, and another is to fulfil it. How to make that the barges were not blown up? After all, the Nazis put not simple, but magnetic mines to find and destroy which is very difficult. And not only mines are dangerous. Fascist pilots bomb caravans of ships, oil refineries, oil storages. I already knew that for actions on the Volga the German command allocated a special squadron of planes, destroyers and bombers. These planes are based in Donbass relatively close to the Volga. When the People's Commissar let us go, I was sought out by the head of the operational department of the flotilla headquarters, Captain Second Rank ES, Kolchin. Kolchin held calmly and with dignity. From the first words I felt that this is a fine staff officer, thinking and executive. Only on May 14th in Sereptinskogo Zaton Stalingrad Amord, finally the steamer railroader with the headquarters of the flotilla, such an unsound name for the headquarters ship we soon replaced the steamer was called Volga. A day later arrived a new chief of staff of the flotilla captain second rank Vissarion Vissarionovich Grigoryev, tall, thin with large facial features, lush sideburns. Grigoryev turned out to be a great comrade and an excellent organiser. He quickly rallied the staff of the headquarters. With Grigoryev and Kolchin decide where to start, what is the most important thing in the fight against mine danger? First of all, to know exactly where the mine lies. It is necessary that each enemy aircraft watched by keen eyes saw when and where he dropped his cargo, and that all this data is immediately reported to headquarters. Special boys will be immediately placed at the places where mines are dropped to warn ships of the danger. And then the minesweepers will come here and destroy the mines. We must have such sharp eyes throughout our operational zone, and it stretches for 1,164 kilometres. How many observation posts do we have now? I asked Kolchin. A few dozen. And we need hundreds. All the head of the communication department of the flotilla captain's second rank Murin. We explain the task. At first he grabbed his head, but then he promised to think about it. I must say that Murin and the chiefs of communication areas Colonels Riani and Gavrilov quickly understood us and turned around. By the end of May we already had 424 special observation posts, provided with reliable communications. And if we take into account our voluntary helpers' cormorants, Komsomol members of the Komsomol Asoviakim, the number of observation points exceeded 700. A.S. Chernov, the secretary of the regional party committee, helped us a lot. Having learned about our needs, he turned to the district party committees. Soon we found both people and necessary materials. And after I awarded the Komsomol members of one local post for the fact that they accurately detected the place of mine fall, young people with a special willingness began to be on duty on the shore. The assistant of the chief of political department on work among Komsomol members, senior lieutenant M.I., Safanov and his activists tirelessly strengthened ties of military sailors with local youth. Sailors taught young workers and collective farmers semaphore alphabet, so that in case of what each of them could send a message to the nearest ship or communication post by flags, taught to recognise silhouettes of enemy planes, quickly locate the places of falling mines. At our observation posts people served differently in cadre sailors' signals and green youths just drafted into the navy, and girls who volunteered for military service. Going by boat along the river, we with the newly appointed member of the military council, Captain First Rank NP. Zarembo on the way looked at the posts, brought newspapers, mail, checked the organisation of service, talked to people. A post on a deserted riverbank was memorable. There served a petty officer of the second article, a very young shy guy and three girls red fleet officers, recent students of the Moscow Technical School of Communication. We found the post in exemplary condition. The logbook was neatly kept. The instruments were kept in the best possible condition. The order was exceptional in the dugout. Here in every detail felt a woman's hand bunks neatly tucked in, white cast duvet covers, on each nightstand napkin, and on it a tin can with a bunch of flowers. We checked the knowledge of the girls, made them work with a signal light. All the personnel of the post received an excellent grade. In a good mood we were about to leave, as suddenly the post foreman appealed to us with a request to listen to him personally. We returned to the dugout. 
The petty officer tightly closed the door and, worried, said, Comrade Commander, I earnestly ask transfer me from this post. I can no longer. I looked and could not believe my eyes just before the guy was cheerful and businesslike, and now his face was flushed, his voice trembling. What happened, petty officer? I asked with surprise. With the girls I can no longer. They serve faithfully, but they do not recognise military discipline. And in general. I order Navy girl Sokolova, pump the water out of the dinghy, and she replied, Senyoka, you've already said that. I'll finish my laundry and pump it out. I explain to her that I'm not Senekka for her, but the commander. And she says, don't take offence, Senekka, and so every day. The member of the military council and I looked at each other. Saying goodbye, I said to the girls. Comrades, Red Fleet, your post is in order, but you should obey the petty officer, address him according to the regulations. Remember that he is your superior. No way, comrade commander, objected one of the girls. How could we offend our Senekka? He is a wonderful fellow, our Senekka. Let's go back to the ship. I'm still indignant, and Zarembo is laughing. There's nothing to be done, he says. We have to change the commander. We had to transfer Seneca to another post, and to the Muscovites to send an elderly petty officer sergeant, wounded in the Black Sea, and came to us from the hospital. He immediately instilled in his subordinates respect for discipline. Looking ahead, I will tell you that hundreds of girls' Red Fleet soldiers served in the flotilla signalers, anti-aircraft gunners, nurses and orderlies. Reviews about them were the best. They worked diligently, characterised by neatness and discipline. Many of them were awarded orders and medals. The daughters of our people, Muscovites and Siberians, Ukrainians and Northerners, left a glorious memory of themselves. They made a worthy contribution to the fight against the enemy. The staff developed a fundamentally new scheme of organisation of the flotilla. Any organisational form should correspond to the task, which is solved by the military team. The new chief of staff rightly noted that in the fall of 1942, when the main task of the flotilla was to assist ground forces in the defence of Stalingrad, the headquarters tried to keep the ships closer to themselves, concentrate them in one fist. Now the task is different to clear the Volga from mines and ensure the safety of navigation for hundreds of kilometres. This requires dispersal of forces throughout the operational zone. So we divided the Volga into two combat areas headed by the commanders of trawling brigades. Each area in turn was divided into four combat areas. In the centre of each area was stationed a division of minesweepers with its headquarters rear, means of communication and hydrography. As a result, wherever a mine fell, the decision to destroy it was taken immediately. The commander of the battle area, aka the commander of the minesweeper division, without waiting for instructions from above, gave the necessary orders. On the spot he knew better whether to close the fairway and look for a bypass or immediately organise trawling. The business of senior chiefs only to check the work and provide assistance. The results of reorganisation were not immediate. I remember well on May 16th in the morning I had to report to the People's Commissar the scheme of the new organisation of the flotilla and five minutes before that the gunboat Red Digestion was blown up on a mine and died. Since I took command of the flotilla, it was the first loss. With a heavy feeling I reported it to the people's commissar. Nikolai Gerasimovich listened to me carefully and, noticing my far from cheerful condition, calmly said. Listen, comrade Pantelayev, did you think that since you took command of the flotilla, the ships would immediately stop being blown up? That's more than naive. It is necessary to create a reliable system of struggle against mines faster. With these words, he took from my hands the scheme of the new organisation, carefully reviewed it and imposed the resolution approve. The next day in the morning, the Commissar and I visited the 4th Brigade of river ships, consisting of armoured boats, mine and patrol boats. The brigade was commanded by Captain 2nd Rank A.I. Sibulski. Ships of this unit heroically acted in the battles for Stalingrad. On the chests of many sailors shone high government awards, now the main task of the brigade was to cover ships and coastal objects from enemy air attack. The warships accompanied the caravans all the way. From the Sereptinsky Zaton, 
where Tsibolsky's headquarters was based, we drove along the coast, looking at mine observation posts. One of these posts was located on a high cliff. Red Fleet girls served here. The commander of the post petty officer of the second article, tall, slender, confidently approached the admiral and clearly gave the report required by the statute. And now, comrade petty officer, report the situation, said the admiral. The girl without hesitation listed what caravans with oil products went up the river, how many and where the Nazis put mines at night in this area. And can you show me where the last mines fell? The girl turned to face the river and stretched out her hand. Do you see, Comrade Admiral, a red tank? There lie two mines. She wanted to add something else, but suddenly in that place rose a high column of water and mud. A deafening explosion came to us. We were, of course, astonished. However, you know the situation perfectly well, Comrade Petty Officer, said the Commissar, smiling. Thank you for your service. Why did the mine explode? Even specialists could not answer this question. There were various assumptions maybe the strong current put some iron object on the mine, or maybe because of a malfunction the mine fuse went off early. But we were once again convinced of what a complex and insidious weapon we are dealing with. Saying goodbye at the airfield, wishing me every success, the Admiral said. Do not forget for a minute the Army aviation. Fleets are waiting for fuel. To deliver it on time is your main task. Try to work amicably with the rivermen. Raise all the people to defend the Volga. Local party organisations will help you. Strengthen ties with them. Returning to the flotilla headquarters, I contacted the rivermen. Soon we came to the head of the Nizhny Volga shipping company MN Chibotav, the head of the Volgo tanker N. Romashchenko and his deputy VI. Sokarin, the head of the Volga Basin Railway Administration VP. Sibin. Everyone was in a gloomy mood. Immediately they began to air their grievances against the military sailors. There were many reasons for grief. The transportation plan is not fulfilled, the caravans are already going slowly, and we delay them on the way every now and then. It turns out that it's all the fault of military sailors. No, it won't work that way, I say. We are solving the same task, and we have to act together. I tell my comrades about our intentions and possibilities and ask, what do you suggest? They say one thing. We must speed up the movement of caravans. But how? Comrades are silent thinking. To melt the ice, I'm the first to propose. What if on the most difficult parts of the river, we will allocate our most powerful gunboats to help the tugboats. Then it will be easier for the caravans to overcome the fast current. It would be great, picks up Romashchenko. The conversation has revived. Together we make another decision to increase the number of air defence ships accompanying the caravans, so that the ships could safely go both day and night. Here was also born an idea to create military pilot stations on the most difficult sections of the route, so that our sailors' specialists would help the captains to guide the caravans among minefields. After this meeting our work with rivermen became more friendly. In particular, we accelerated the arrival of ships, which we converted as quickly as possible into minesweepers and gunboats. They arrived together with their crews. Often on one ship there was a whole dynasty of rivermen father and mother, sons and daughters, grandchildren. Inspecting one of such ships, equipped from a tugboat, I asked the captain, an old Vulgarian with a thick beard. Daddy, won't it be hard for you to sail with your family? No way, we're used to it. We've been sailing together for years. Our mother and son can drive as well as I can. And we're always ready to stand up for our native Volga. Our military hydrographers, headed by Captain First Rank IF, Novoselov, and Chiefs of Technical Sections of the Route KS, Imianov, BI, Kizhov and NI. Simonov worked hand in hand. As a result of their efforts, a new system of lighting of navigational fencing of fairways appeared. Barrel lights were now lit only when ships were approaching, and the lighting of buoys was carried out in such a way that they were visible only to ships and completely invisible to airplanes. A special instruction for sailing was developed. The role of party political work increased. 
Even before the caravan left Astrakhan, short meetings were held at the berths. Appeals to the rivermen of the military council of the flotilla were read out with the call for uninterrupted movement in light and dark time. The crews of the ships here also took on increased obligations. Political workers studied the needs of the sailors and quickly reported them to the military council. A member of the military council, Captain First Rank NP. Zarembo, an educated and energetic man, together with the head of the political department of the flotilla, Rear Admiral P.T. Bondarenko, mobilised political workers and the entire party activists for effective assistance to the party organisations of steamship lines and coastal areas. Lieutenant Colonel B.E., Wolfson and Major K.P. Abrozenko worked hard in this direction. The flotilla command was rarely at headquarters most of the time we spent on the river, visiting battle stations, observation posts, batteries and ships. I had never sailed on rivers before and had a lot to get used to. The flagship was commanded by a senior lieutenant from the reserve, a former Volga pilot Belov, who knew the Volga very well. Sometimes we approached a battery, I ordered by custom. Comrade commander, anchor against the battery and lower the Tuzik, we will go ashore. Belov looks at me with surprise. He takes my words for a joke and orders in his own way. Vasya, he says to the helmsman, take half aboard to starboard. And you, Mikhailo, this is already addressed to the bosun, prepare the tug over there under that birch. The boat rolls quickly to the right and burrows into the coastal bushes, so that almost the whole ship is hidden in the greenery, moored by the bow cable to a tree. I reprimanded Belov for his panache with his subordinates, eventually taught him the statutory conversation, but he could not get along with the expression half aboard and give the tippet. Well, we never anchored in the seaward way. At first we had unexpected misunderstandings with local comrades. Once the chief of staff Grigoryev put in front of me a note from a district policeman from the village of Dubki. I read, Your military boats detonate very strong charges to silence fish, which is poaching and is strictly punishable. It's both funny and sad. It means that we have not reached all villages and hamlets with our explanatory work, if some places take the destruction of mines as poaching. I order the commander of the combat area to find the author of the message and invite him to the minesweeper to see with his own eyes the work of sailors and convinced of its importance. We study the tactics of fascist aviation. Every day in the evening a German scout flies in to find out where the caravans are going and where our air defence forces are. Then, already in the darkness, two groups of airplanes show up at a low altitude. One is coming with onboard lights on, with an obvious desire to attract the attention of our searchlights, anti-aircraft gunners and fighters. These planes follow along the river against the current, do not miss an opportunity to drop bombs on our batteries and air defence ships to bombard them with guns. In a word, they try to create more noise. And at the same time, another group of destroyer planes is descending aside and with engines off, almost silently flying along the stream, sticking to the meadow bank, so as not to give themselves away by shadows on the river surface. In the silence of the night, the pop of a parachute is heard, followed by a splash. Having dropped its cargo, the plane continues to fly over the water, diverting attention while others drop mines. It's a pretty tricky tactic, but we figured it out quickly. Hydrographers Captain Lieutenants V.P. Grek and Jai Bashilov had an idea to install false buoys away from the fairway. They consulted with I.I. Zimin. The foreman of the situation area. He, it turns out, had already thought about it himself. In a short period of time, by efforts of sailors and rivermen, dozens of sites with false navigation situation were created. Cormorants, A.K., Vednetsky and I and Sitnikov worked on it with special zeal. Many did not believe in our idea, saying that it was very primitive, that the fascists were not fools. What was our common joy when on the first night German pilots dropped their entire mine cargo on one of these false fairways? The military council ordered the officers hydrographers, three tankers and a large group of rivermen and Red Fleet men with high governmental awards. Among the awardees were senior boyman MV, Plokutenko, who for 20 days accident-free led through minefields and narrows more than 40 caravans, Boyman VA, Treshev, 
accurately identified the location of 18 enemy mines. If for the whole year 1942 the enemy dropped 50 mines into the river, then only for May 1943 we recorded the fall of 364 magnetic and magnetic acoustic mines. They had different multiplicity from 2 to 16. This meant that the minesweeper had to pass over a mine up to 16 times to make it explode. This, of course, slowed things down, and Moscow kept hurrying to speed up transportation. Almost every night the People's Commissar Nikolai Gerasimovich Kuznetsov called. How are things going? Where are the caravans? Not without pleasure I report that the barges are going without losses. So far none of them has not been blown up on a mine or sunk by a bomb. Often Anastas Ivanovich Mikoyan also called. He demanded exact figures. How much fuel was transported per day? I always had the data at the ready. I immediately called the amount. And in response I heard a soft but insistent. Not enough, comrade Pantelayev. It is necessary to increase transportation by all means. We have fulfilled the transportation plan in May only by 76.5%. We are doing our best to speed up the movement of caravans. And difficulties arose at every step. We created more than 15 basing points for minesweepers and other ships throughout our operational zone. These points were dozens of kilometres apart. We had to bring fuel, ammunition, food to them. And the only way by river, under the continuous threat of enemy raids. It was not easy in such conditions to establish the supply of more than 400 observation posts and more than 300 minesweepers, but the head of the rear, Colonel of the Intendant Service Vasily Ivanovich Krivonogov, and his staff brilliantly coped with the case. When visiting ships, batteries and posts, NP, Zarembo and I never heard any complaints about poor supply and food. We were concerned about one more problem. One of the consequences of the recent grandiose battle at Stalingrad was the pollution of the river. Corpses were still floating down the Volga. They were stuck in the thickets and decomposing. The threat of epidemics hung all the time. But we avoided them. We owe a lot to our medics, who were headed by Lieutenant Colonel A.S. Krupin, now candidate of medical sciences and honoured doctor of the Republic. No matter how difficult it was for us with the ship staff, Krupin managed to get a small vessel, equipped it with a mobile sanitary epidemiologic laboratory. This floating cell continuously travelled along the Volga, visited observation posts and garrisons, did a lot of work on disease prevention. Maybe that is why we lived relatively quietly, we did not have a single case of mass diseases. Moscow constantly helped us. Rear Admiral N.I. Shibayev, the head of the mine and torpedo department of the People's Commissariat of the Navy, a great expert in his field and a tireless worker, visited us. He gave valuable advice on how to better organise trawling forces to improve trawling. Nikolai Ivanovich, together with our flagship miner Captain 3rd Rank P.D., Lysenko spent whole days on trawlers and in the workshops helping to equip trawl barges and going out for trawling. General Vasily Danilovich Sergeev, the Chief of Air Defence of the Navy, came to visit us. He did a lot to strengthen our air defence. With the Head of Air Defence of the Flotilla Lieutenant Colonel Aid Miralyubov, he went around all our combat areas, helped to form 15 coastal anti-aircraft batteries, covering the most narrow places of the fairways, to arm 20 special ships and dozens of boats air defence, which began to manoeuvre along the river and in the most unexpected places to meet enemy aircraft fire. Anti-aircraft guns and machine guns appeared on transport ships. More than 150 air defence platoons were formed, they began to accompany every steamship and every caravan of barges from Astrakhan to Saratov. These platoons, as well as all anti-aircraft batteries, were staffed with girl soldiers. At first, the captains of steamships were sceptical of their appearance, also the army, but after meetings with Nazi planes, the opinion changed radically. Captain D.V. Glubov told me. When the plane rushed at us in a dive, everyone hid, the girls quietly worked at the gun. And one of them, like a child, clung to the machine gun and shot, shot, shot. The Nazi's nerves gave out, he turned away and dropped his bombs wherever he could. On the captain's recommendation, I awarded Shkitina and Karachevskaya anti-aircraft gunners with combat medals. Our heroic fighters, based at airfields in Astrakhan, 
Kamishin and Stalingrad selflessly covered the river from the air. And on the Volga went and went caravans with oil, guarded by ships of the 4th Brigade under the command of Tsibolsky. Thanks to the measures taken by us fascists did not risk to fly below 600 metres, they dropped the cargo as it happened. Many mines fell into the forest and meadows. The movement for acceleration of cargo transportation was unfolding all along the Volga. The first to carry the caravan in record time was the tug steamship Eagle. Following him, the record was set by the steamer 25th anniversary of October Revolution. Those who distinguished themselves were awarded orders. By the way, to call to the headquarters awarded rivermen was unthinkable, because they are always on the move. Together with Zarembo go out on a half-glider, meet the caravan. The crew free from watch is lined up on deck. I call the names, the rivermen come out of the line, and present them with awards. I remember on one steamship, travelling with barges, I presented the Order of the Red Star to the captain and mechanic, as well as medals anti-aircraft gunners of the Air Defence Platoon. There was a woman with a child in her arms. Distressed, she was sobbing quietly, wiping her tears, and a nimble little boy of about six years old was holding on to her skirt. It turned out that it was the wife and children of the captain. We shouted hurrah, wished happy sailing, and barely glider departed from the board. We clearly heard the captain's voice musher, take a little to the right. It was he who commanded his daughter, who was standing at the helm. Waving his cap at us, the captain commanded, now into the intercom Ivan Lysandrik. Come on full, and the old steamer slammed even faster on the water, with the slabs of its wheels, dragging three big barges behind it. Every day we had more and more friends and helpers. Hundreds of collective farmers and collective farmers, old and young, spent days and nights on the bank of the river, not to miss the moment of the fall of the mine, to detect this place and immediately report to the nearest post. In June, Lieutenant General I.V., Rogov, head of the main political department of the Navy, came to our flotilla, and we went with him on an armoured boat to the headquarters of the 1st Trawling Brigade in Cherny Yar. Being on the bridge, Rogov noticed men, women and children sitting on the riverbank. It seemed as if they came out to meet someone. The general asked me, What does this mean? The local population is helping us to fight the Nazis. The general thought for a moment and then said, That's great. Do you encourage their zeal in any way? I reported that dozens of collective farmers have already received cash bonuses for detecting mines, and some have received government awards. I tell about an old collective farmer, Antonina Tikhonovna Polovnikova. In the evening she was rinsing laundry on the, on the river when she heard the noise of an airplane. It was flying low, it was frightening, but the collective farmer did not leave, she watched it carefully. She saw him throw something heavy into the water. The airplane flew away, but the old woman kept her eyes on the place where the strange cargo had fallen. As luck would have it, Red Fleet Officer Ladigin was passing along the shore. After listening to the old woman, he ran to the nearest post and reported the incident to the headquarters of the combat area. Then he returned to the shore, undressed and began to look for a mine, because the place was shallow. And the old collective farmer kept shouting to him where to swim and where to dive. Ladigin found the mine it was lying near the shore. In the morning, when the minesweeper came, the sailor showed the minesweepers this place. The mine was quickly destroyed. On the same day we gave Polovnikova and Ladigin money awards, and collective farm girls Tanya Yudina and Anya Nina for a short time detected places of falling of several mines. On the presentation of the head of the northern communication area of Colonel K.G., Ryani friends were awarded the medal for military service. I also told about the fact that recently the Buoys began to report mines fall with some special sound. At first we thought that the Germans started to use new weapons, but the cormorants found the bound pieces of rails and barrels with stones dropped from airplanes. We thanked the rivermen for this discovery from the bottom of our hearts. Otherwise we would have trawled here and wondered why the mines did not explode. This is how simple cormorants exposed another enemy trick. Do not be stingy in encouraging such people, said I.V. Rogov. Our boat moored at Arktuba, the headquarters ship of the 1st Trawling Brigade. We were met by the brigade commander, 
a.k.a. the commander of the first combat area, Captain First Rank P.A., Smirnov an old Baltic Bolshevik, an active participant of the October Revolution. Now he is an excellent mind specialist. Smirnov is stingy with words but greedy for work. He did not hide difficulties but did not complain about them. With pride told the brig about the military valour of commanders and sailors of minesweepers. Ensign I.I. Skobelev, Chief Petty Officers M.M. Iosevich, V.S. Kampanets, Petty Officer of the First Article I.M. Simonov have on their account not only destroyed mines but also shot down fascist airplanes. Motorist Petty Officer of the First Article S.P. Zhukov has mastered the second specialty machine gunner. Recently the boat minesweeper had to fight with a Nazi airplane flying low over the water. Zhukov was wounded several times, but did not let go of the machine gun. He shot until the enemy plane crashed into the water. Where is Zhukov now? Rogov asked. In our infirmary, answered the head of the political department of the brigade, Captain First Rank ID, Blainov. Doctors counted ten wounds. But the petty officer begged not to send him to the rear. Friends visit Zhukov every day. He asks how the repair of the boat is progressing, and jokes, let's see who will be repaired sooner the boat or me. Yes, with such heroes you can roll mountains, said General Rogov. Soon we noticed that the Germans began to drop fewer mines. Not that the stock of them dried up, or the enemy was convinced that we learned to quickly disarm these weapons. But bombing raids became more frequent. It became known that the enemy twice bombed factories in Gorky. He had not touched us yet, and, as it turned out, not for nothing. On June 2nd, fascist aviation made a massive raid on the Kursk railway junction. The Germans lost 145 airplanes. By the way, among those shot down were also Heinkels, previously flying to the Volga as destroyers. So, bad things Hitler's aviation, we thought, if it has to use specially equipped destroyers in the role of conventional bombers. But it was too early to rejoice. On June 12th, about 50 junkers bombed Saratov. The message about the appearance of enemy planes we received from air defence posts in time, so our fighters had time to fly out to intercept. Bombers flew in groups. One of them was heading to the railroad bridge over the Volga. Our artillerymen and anti-aircraft gunners managed to defend this most important strategic object. Another group of German planes bombed the cracking plant and caused some damage to it. In the reflection of the air raid played a big role in the artillery of the ships of our 3rd Brigade of cannon boats. Its commander, Captain 2nd Rank PD. Sargiev, who was the senior marine chief in the area, quickly dispersed the ships on the roadstead. They were firing at the airplanes, covering the oil barges and the bridge. When we, leaning over the operational map, passed the actions of our troops to repel the enemy raid, Chief of Staff of the Flotilla Grigoryev said, Fascists, this not quite successful raid will probably not be limited. We need to cover Saratov more reliably, especially the railroad bridge. The head of the operational department, Kolchin, proposed to form another, ninth, combat area in the area of Saratov. I decided to send to the disposal of Sargiev additional division of smoke smoke boats, a detachment of armoured boats and two floating anti-aircraft batteries. The plane went to Saratov Flotilla Flotty, flagship chemist Captain 2nd Rank Zemlyanichenko, his task to organise smoke of the bridge and other objects in case of an enemy raid. Our assumptions were justified. On June 13th the fascists repeated the raid on the cracking plant and the next day on the railway bridge. Zemlyanichenko perfectly coped with his task the bridge was smoky, the fascists did not find it at night, and the bombs fell into the river. Smoke curtains helped to save the plant as well. A few days later, 30 fascist bombers raided Kamishin. The main blows they aimed at the oil depot, elevator and tannery. By friendly efforts of army men and sailors, the raid was repulsed. Lieutenant General M.S. Gromadin, commander-in-chief of the air defence of the country, flew to Kubishev. He received us, considered our plan of air defence of the Volga, especially the arrangement of forces to protect the Saratov Bridge and the raid. He approved it. At parting, the general with a smile remarked, since the sailors have taken up the defence of the bridge, we cannot worry about it. We were flattered to hear these words, but we realised that they obliged us to a lot. 
Without delay, we immediately headed for Saratov. At the crossing, we received a report that last night fascists again bombed Kamishin. The fascist aviation attacked our anti-aircraft battery in Gorny Balik. It was an excellent battery. Its anti-aircraft gunners had already fought with the enemy many times, and every time came out victorious. Fighter planes and anti-aircraft fire did not allow the fascists to conduct targeted bombing. Neither the city nor the ships at the roadstead were harmed. The senior naval chief in Kamishin was Captain 2nd Rank VA, Krinov, commander of the 2nd Minesweeper Brigade, a man of determination and energy. There were also division commanders to match him. I especially remember the commander of the 6th Division, Lieutenant Captain A.F. Arshavkin. He was day and night on the river, going from ship to ship. Having learned about the approach of enemy planes, Arshavkin managed to pull up his ships to the roadstead, and they also took part in the reflection of the raid. I will note at once, V.A. Krinov showed himself a skillful organiser, worked amicably with the rivermen. And the results were evident he was the first to finish the battle trawling and cleared the mines from the shallow fairways of his area. On the same night of June 19th we learned from our neighbours sailors of the Caspian flotilla that the fascists bombed Astrakhan, set fire to the oil barge and floating fish factory. The submarine Lenin, reflecting the raid, hit a Nazi bomber. The crew landed on the water and tried to escape on an inflatable boat. A fishing motorboat passing by took the Germans prisoner. Among them was Major Clias, the commander of the destroyer squadron operating on the Volga. He was a hardened fascist, his chest was decorated with four iron crosses. He behaved violently, the fishermen had to deal with him. In the fight, Clias was killed. He had with him a map with all flight routes to the Volga. It was a very important document for us. We congratulated our neighbours on their good luck. We arrived in Saratov in the afternoon of June 20th. The boat was camouflaged in the greenery near the eastern shore. We listened to the report of Captain Second Rank Sergeyev about the air defence measures taken by him and went around all our ships. The mood of the sailors was combative. They again and again checked anti-aircraft guns and machine guns. Railroad bridge light tracery string hung over the river, Trains with ammunition equipment, troops were continuously running along it. Here came the ways from the Urals, Central Asia, Siberia. Not in vain the fascists were so hungry for this bridge. Dusk came. The city was quiet. Not a light. The darkening was excellent. But still sometimes short whistles were heard when policemen or military patrols noticed a glowing gap somewhere. Our ships were included in the general plan for the defence of the city. It was almost completely dark when several barrage balloons rose into the sky. Not enough, I thought. I remembered a whole forest of balloons looming in the sky above Leningrad. There was silence on the river, our ships lurked, guns looking into the sky. From the shore post came an air raid signal. They're flying. In a few minutes from the bridge of the BMK we heard the growing rumble of aircraft engines and sharp barking of anti-aircraft guns. At once searchlights flashed beams, like swords, crossed and diverged apart. The bursts of shells were overhead, but no airplanes could be seen. From the noise we could tell that they were coming in waves. It was reported that our fighters are in the air. But they could not be seen either, and it was impossible to make out anything in the darkness. Only blue stripes of searchlights were visible. I looked towards the bridge. It disappeared in the veil of smoke screens put by the ships. Nikolai Petrovich Zarembo spoke quietly. It is good that there is no strong wind, the veils stand still. And Zemlyanichenko was good dense smoke put. Around the boat heard gurgling it was falling fragments of anti-aircraft shells. Comrade Commander, you violate the uniform carefully noted the commander of the boat. Zarembo and I obediently put on steel helmets. All the ships fired. Our BMK-1 was also firing. The sailors assured that they could see airplanes well at the points of crossed beams. We could not see anything from the bridge until flare bombs hung over the city like chandeliers they were dropped by fascist planes, which nevertheless broke through the fire screen. Anti-aircraft guns hit the chandeliers too. But it is not easy to hit them, and they burn for a long time, slowly descending. 
the Germans are dropping bombs. They do not see the bridge, the bombs fall on the east bank of the river, on the city of Engels. There are fires there. Unfortunately, the fascists broke through to the cracking plant. A deafening explosion rumbles. The night is illuminated by a bright, blinding light. It exploded almost empty gasoline storage. In the city there were also a few pockets of fire, but they were quickly extinguished. Very soon everything began to subside, silenced anti-aircraft guns on the shore and on the ships. The most important thing for us is the bridge. How is it? It's still intact. The searchlights are going out, but the alarm is still not going off. How many planes were there? It's always hard to know at night. They said there were about a hundred, but I think it was less. In the morning we went around the ships. Almost every commander assured us that his sailors had shot down an airplane. And on the shore smoking wreckage of only two junkers. It's a pity there weren't more. And who exactly shot down, whose cannon is not so important. It is important that everyone shot, shot well, because only seven or eight airplanes broke through to the city. The others dropped their cargo far from the target. In the regional party committee, where we went before leaving Saratov, we were thanked for the reliable defence of the bridge. We left the division of smoke screeners in Saratov. He stood there for a long time, but the fascists did not appear anymore. Apparently they were concentrating their aviation on the Kursk Bulge, where the main events were brewing. And caravans with oil products for our army kept coming and coming. The enemy could not stop this endless flow. At the end of June, the fascists again began to pelt the Volga with mines and bomb ports and caravans. We replenished the air defence equipment of Sergeyev's and Tibulski's brigades, and yet the voyage became more and more difficult and dangerous. The thing is that the low water summer water recession was coming. It became more difficult to find bypass fairways in the river. The speed of the current was increasing, so we could not fulfil the June plan of oil transportation. We were consoled only by the fact that all 700,000 and more tonnes of oil products loaded in Astrakhan were delivered to their destination without losses. In July we added more minesweepers and intensified trawling. The main low water fairways were opened, which shortened the way for ships. We strained every effort to increase oil transportation. The decisive offensive of the Soviet troops on the fronts was approaching. Moscow demanded more fuel. We used almost the entire brigade of can boats as additional tugs to speed up the caravans. The situation on the river remained tense. We had etched more than 200 mines, but still more than 300 remained. The demagnetization of ships at a special station in Saratov, unfortunately, did not give a full guarantee, especially in low water, when the fairways were shallow and ships had to go in close proximity to mines. And there were cases of detonation of warships. A heavy impression was made by the destruction of a small minesweeper. Not a trace of the ship was left. The explosion was of colossal force. The mine lay in a shallow place, and to all appearances, the minesweeper passed over it. This suggested the idea of launching a trawl barge in front of the minesweeper. The first to use this method was midshipman Diryabin, commander of the trawler of the 4th Division. It worked. Several mines were detonated. The essence of this method was that the minesweeper on a long tugboat let the trawl barge go downstream and followed it. It was not always possible, especially at the turns of the river, the barge was always going off the intended course. But gradually we learned to control the trawl movement on such sections as well. All divisions picked up Diryabin's method. It was important that failures did not discourage people, but on the contrary made creative thought work. In this sense, our newspaper for the native Volga did a lot, which skillfully picked up and spread everything new. By the way, the journalistic staff of the newspaper editor Emmanuel Prylutsky, poet Alexander Yashin, correspondents Valerian Monikov and Nikolai Nold was characterised by initiative and efficiency in everything. Soon after the minesweeper was lost, a Komsomol girl, petty officer of the second article, Tatiana Kuprianova, came to me and insistently asked me to allocate her a minesweeper and to allow to staff its crew only with girls. Aren't you afraid? The girl even took offence. I said that I would think about it, but frankly speaking, I did not dare for a long time. I was persuaded by experts, saying that Kuprianova had picked a good crew and the girls would do their job. 
I agreed with a heavy heart and allocated an old boat. The girls repaired it by their own efforts, installed trawls and reported on the readiness to carry out combat duty. Before the first departure, I myself meticulously inspected the ship, checked the knowledge of the team. The impression was the best, and I gave the go-ahead to go out. Soon we received a report Kuprianova's crew detonated a mine. Then the second. Third. By the end of the campaign the whole crew was honoured with government awards and received large cash bonuses. Once I went to the operator's cabin to look at a large map of the situation. Operator's Major DG. Dimaprov and Lieutenant Captain IA. Ananin marked the areas where mines appeared when the water receded. In, in a few days they were found and destroyed more than a dozen. Luck. On the other hand, the water recession hindered us many places became so shallow that minesweepers could not pass there. What to do? As always in such cases, the sailors' ingenuity helped us. Sailors undressed and, holding hands, in a front line went through a shallow place, groping the sandy bottom with their feet. Quite an original way of trawling, wasn't it? All this was done with jokes and jokes, as if the guys were leading a round dance. Theoretically, the mine could not explode if even stepped on, because the human body does not have a magnetic field, but still it was a mine, not a watermelon or a melon. What if it was a contact mine, exploding at the slightest touch? And to look at such trawling was quite disturbing. But I chased away the gloomy thoughts, admiring the healthy, tanned bodies of cheerful, never dull sailors. Fortunately, there were no accidents, and we found plenty of mines. In early July, the Battle of Kursk began. Having repulsed the German offensive, our troops struck a powerful blow. On August 5th, Oral was liberated. On all ships listened to the radio rumble of the first victory salute during the war. We were happy our modest contribution to this victory was also ours. In July we exceeded the plan, transported more than a million tonnes of oil products. Hundreds of our minesweepers continued trawling the open shallow water fairways. Sailors realised the importance of their labour. Without fuel, which we transported, not a single tank would have attacked, not a single airplane would have taken off, our submarines would not have gone to the sea. In these days, the People's Commissar of the Navy Kuznetsov and People's Commissar of the River Fleet Shashkov arrived at the flotilla again. This time they did not hear the claims of neither the flotilla to the rivermen nor the rivermen to the military sailors. Now we worked amicably, helped each other in everything. Having familiarised themselves with the progress of the government's assignments, the two commissars warned us not to be complacent and not to lose vigilance. At the end of August we received an order to transfer some of our ships to the newly formed Dnieper military flotilla. We loaded the boats on the platforms. Leads this case VV. Grigory of our chief of staff appointed commander of the new flotilla, and his place was taken by Captain First Rank ND. Sergei, former commander of the 3rd Brigade. Being a good officer, Nikolay Dmitrievich turned out to be an excellent staff specialist. True, he had a big school he worked in the main naval staff. And here, on the Volga, his talent showed itself in all its breadth. It was easy to work with him. Autumn had come. The lowering of the water level hampered the actions of minesweepers. Often in shallow water they damaged propellers. We had no docks. We had to do everything afloat. The flotilla's flagship mechanic, engineer captain of the second rank SG, Ionov, showed exceptional ingenuity. He flooded the bow of the ship, thereby raising the stern and exposing the propeller. Now it could be removed and straightened. Under the blows of our troops, the enemy was rolling back to the west. He was no longer interested in the Volga. But not so long ago, the fascist diplomat Ribbentrop declared, as soon as our domination over the main communication artery of the country over the Volga is established, our most dangerous enemy will be dealt such a blow, from which he will never recover again. The fascists understood the importance of the Volga for our country, but their robbery plans were not destined to come true. They were defeated in Stalingrad, their bet on mine warfare also failed. Before the onset of winter we destroyed 751 German mines. Navigation continued in full swing. On the river passed 8,000 ships, they carried seven million tons of petroleum products. It was the final battle for the Volga. The Soviet people highly appreciated the actions of the Volga military flotilla 
the feet of all those who fought and worked at that time on the great Russian river, fulfilling their duty as soldiers and citizens. The life of a sailor is nomadic, restless, and the life of a military sailor is even more so. As the song goes on the seas, on the waves today here, tomorrow there. Having lived a long life in the Navy and with the Navy, I can say that it has its own charm, its own romance. You see new places, new people, learn a lot, and at the same time you grow up, accumulating knowledge and experience. I travelled a lot, and this time, barely on the Volga ended combat suffering, I was appointed commander of the White Sea Flotilla after a second short service in the main naval staff, and, having received the order of the Commissar of People's Commissars, hurried to Arkhangelsk. The White Sea Flotilla was one of the largest in the number of ships and the scale of combat activity. It played a special role in the defence of our Arctic communications, but organisationally was part of the Northern Fleet, and therefore its affairs dissolved. In the general flow of combat achievements of the North Sea, Dot, 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 I, N, R, Kangelsk at the station I was met by the Chief of Staff of the Flotilla, Rear Admiral V.P. Bogorpov are very colourful and widely known in the fleet. We once served on the Black Sea, fought in the Baltic and now we met again. I was happy about it, knowing that Viktor Platonovich is a highly educated man with a flexible mind and a broad outlook. It is always a pleasure to work with such people. It seems that the war is coming to an end, he said. It is time to think about the plan of combat training in relation to peacetime conditions. Don't be in a hurry, I remarked. I think we still have enough to do. We headed for the city. The bridge across the northern Divina had not been built yet. There was only one way by water. We boarded the staff boat. The appearance and behaviour of the crew, as in a mirror, always reflects the military organisation. I immediately noticed the cleanliness of the boat, the neat clothes of the sailors, admired their impeccably precise movements. Naval order seems to be firmly established everywhere. Soon I was convinced that the flotilla, despite its youth, followed the best traditions of the Soviet Navy. My predecessor Vice Admiral S.G. Kucherov and a member of the Military Council, Rear Admiral V.E. And none it both experienced? Combat leaders did a lot to maintain an exemplary military order. I considered it a great honour to command such a flotilla. The headquarters of the flotilla was located in the centre of the city, in a beautiful two-storey mansion on the embankment of the Northern Divina. Not far from the headquarters, also on the very bank of the river, in a small cosy harbour, was a securely sheltered command post with modern means of communication, working and living quarters, kitchen and dining room. At that time, such a command post could be envied by any fleet. The ship composition of the flotilla was first of all light forces capable to fight against fascist submarines and mine danger, to defend sea communications and bases. Most of them were fishing and transport ships, during the war hastily re-equipped and armed. There were fewer ships of special military construction. However, their number increased sharply after the GKO decision in March 1944, to strengthen the combat power of the flotilla ships and aircraft. The flotilla also included the naval fleet of the main directorate of the Northern Sea Route with icebreakers, aviation and port facilities on Dixon Island. Gradually I am getting acquainted with the new service. The first acquaintance with the personnel left the best impression. Everywhere I saw cheerful, energetic people, loving their ship and their service and ready to fulfil any task. I remember, in the semi-crew of Captain Second Rank Belozorov, I was talking to young sailors who had just been called up to the fleet. I asked, how are you guys living? What do you lack? They answered with glee, we're living well. And then I asked them the same question, comrade commander. How are things at the front? Will we soon defeat the Nazis? When will we be painted for warships? Not far from Cape Sviatoynos, in a vast bay was our base, guarding the entrance to the White Sea. Its organiser, Captain First Rank A.I. Dianov was before the war the commander of a detachment of frontier ships based on the Kola Peninsula. Then they moved here, to the throat of the White Sea. They were excellent seaworthy and fast ships. They were manned by people accustomed to the harsh northern sea. Fine, hardy sailors, they changed the green frontier flag to the white and blue naval flag. 
the former frontier patrol ship brilliant under the command of Lieutenant Captain A.A. Kosmeniuk was the first in the flotilla to open the account of sunk enemy boats. The second such a great victory was won by the patrol ship Breeze under the command of Lieutenant V.A. Kyrieve. Captain First Rank A.I. Dianov could be proud of his students. The flotilla took in its ranks brave and skillful warriors. In the second year of the war, the operational zone of the flotilla was considerably expanded and Captain First Rank A.I. Dianov was entrusted to form a naval base on Novaya Zemlya, under his leadership sailors in a short period of time on bare rocks, where yesterday polar bears and wild geese lived, built service and residential buildings, warehouses, berths, airfield and naval batteries necessary for the defence of the base. In all the bases and bays of the Arctic, where our transports were sheltered from storms and fascist submarines, and where the enemy landing force could land, the coastal batteries of the flotilla were installed, as well as the army batteries of the Arkhangelsk military district, with which the flotilla closely cooperated. All our coastal defence was headed by Major General P.I. Lakovnikov. Viktor Platonovich Bogopov reported to me about the composition of the flotilla. I asked him to show the boundaries of our operational zone. Nikishtaba smiled slyly, looked at the member of the military council Vyananik, went to a large map hanging on the wall, and led the pointer. Yes, this is the scale. The pointer slid from the throat of the White Sea to Novaya Zemlya, outlined the Kara Sea, and the Laptev Sea all the way to Tixi Bay. Only along the coast, the Arctic zone stretches for 4,000 kilometres, said the Chief of Staff. At the first stage of the war, the flotilla was in a special position. The fascists cut the Kirov Railroad and the White Sea Baltic Canal. Allied convoys with military cargoes from England and the USA could be unloaded only in Arkhangelsk. It was necessary to hastily build new berths and warehouses here to create teams for the fastest unloading of transports. The first convoy of seven transports arrived in Arkhangelsk without losses on August 31, 1941, and by the end of the year ten more convoys passed safely to both sides. The fascist fleet in the north was not very active at that time. The fascists threw all forces on the land direction, seeking to capture Murmansk and Arkhangelsk, the main ports through which our maritime communications with the Allies. But the enemy's plans collapsed. All the war ports in the north remained in our hands. Convinced of the failure, the Nazis began to concentrate their naval forces in the Fjords of northern Norway with the task of disrupting our communications. We had to improve the system of convoy service. In this direction much was done by the flotilla's military transport service department headed by Captain First Rank Bogiev. It was an educated and enterprising officer. The scale of the convoy service was increasing. If in the first year transports from Arkhangelskin convoys went only to the Novovovozmelsk Straits and further to the Kara Sea, went independently in 1944 to counteract fascist submarines we had to extend the convoy service not only throughout the Kara Sea, but also beyond its limits, to the Laptev Sea and to the islands of Komsomolskaya Pravda. Each of our transports was assigned a naval officer as a military assistant to the captain and a special military team consisting of commanders, machine gunners, signalers and radio operators. The formation of these teams, associated with the incessant movement of people, as well as the creation of unloading teams on shore, required a lot of organisational work, with which excellently coped with Captain Second Rank Babinski. Outwardly slow, but in fact fast and hasty, Babinski had time to visit everywhere, to see and eliminate problems. The commander of a small convoy was usually appointed senior of the commanders of escort warships. The command of especially responsible convoys was entrusted to someone from the commanders of formations or chiefs of staff of naval bases. Often in this role were the chief of staff of the Kara base Captain Second Rank Vasiliev, commanders of compounds Captain Second Rank Kotenko, Dudarev and Agafonov. When I took the flotilla to command large convoys headed for the Arctic, most often entrusted to the commander of the Arkhangelsk Ovra, Captain First Rank Napiavchenko, a fine sailor, strong-willed and determined. Despite frequent and persistent attacks of fascist submarines, Piavchenko conducted convoys without losses. He willingly went on any campaign, which sometimes lasted for many weeks. 
We were not spoiled by the weather cold autumn storms caught the ships on the passage and battered them for weeks. Our men withstood everything. I remember Pievchenko telling me. You go one day, two days. Nobody bothers you. Suddenly the acoustician shouts over the trumpet, I hear a submarine on the right 45 everything on the bridge, goes into motion at once. I command right rudder. I give the course, but miners rush to the bombometers. But I can't see or hear the boat. Contact is lost. And the minesweeper coming from behind has raised the signal enemy submarine and is turning away. We hear the deafening explosions of depth charges. The ship shudders a little. All eyes of signalmen and officers are fixed on the water. We're looking for a torpedo trail or a submarine periscope. It is very unpleasant not to see the enemy, but to feel that he is somewhere very close, just waiting to hit you in the side with a torpedo. Even in the frost it gets hot, I unbutton the collar of the raglan. Ten minutes pass. Little by little we calm down. And in an hour or two everything starts again. And so every day... Not always the trip ended safely. In August 1944 in the Kara Sea, the commander of the convoy captain first rank a dot three. Shmelev. He was on the TSH-114. The fascists in this navigation began to use hydroacoustic electric torpedoes, which rushed without a trace at the sound of the working propellers, pursued and caught up with the ship. It was very difficult to evade such torpedoes. Theoretically, it would be necessary to stop the course, but it is not always possible, because you do not know what torpedo attacks the enemy. The loss of the minesweeper made us sad. But our determination did not shake. Sailors began to study the tactics of the enemy even more thoroughly. It was found that at the end of the Arctic navigation with the appearance of ice in the Kara Sea, fascist submarines moved to the southeastern region of the Barents Sea in order to intercept convoys on the approaches to the throat of the White Sea. We took this into account and strengthened the protection of convoys. On October 24, 1944, our convoy was on its way from the Kara Sea to Arkhangelsk. In the area of Kanin Noz, it was attacked by several fascist submarines. Among other ships, the minesweeper TSH-116, commanded by Lieutenant Captain B.A. Babanov was guarding the transports. Sailors of this ship in August witnessed the death of their comrades on the TSH-114. They were burning with a thirst for revenge against the enemy. Having detected the submarine, Babanov resolutely went on the attack and dropped a series of bombs. Apparently the boat was damaged and lay on the ground. Accompanying the convoy anti-submarine aircraft found an oil slick on the water, descended and dropped a few more depth charges, followed by a patrol ship, small Hunter Mo 251, and finally, destroyer Doblesny bombed the area. The solar stain blurred, air bubbles burst out of the depths, and then some wooden debris floated up. Rejoiced by the luck, we immediately reported to the fleet headquarters, and using the direct telephone with Moscow, also to the People's Commissar of the Navy. But from Polyani and Moscow we heard the same question, where are the proofs that the boat was destroyed? Some days on the surface kept oil circles and burst air bubbles, but all this was not yet considered irrefutable evidence of the boat's destruction and there was no need to take offence at the superiors. What to hide, because often combat reports on enemy losses sinned, to put it mildly, inaccuracies. We ourselves forced the higher command to demand solid confirmation of the results of the attack. And it had to happen a week later, while following the next convoy in the same area TSH-111 and TSH-113 again, attacked a Nazi boat. On my new report again in the telephone receiver, sounded where is the evidence, but this time everything was in order. We sent to the area of the attack destroyer Daring, which had reliable sonar. Inspecting the battle site in detail, our sailors found both submarines lying on the ground, once again dropped depth bombs on them. Wooden objects and the corpse of a Hitlerite floated to the surface. Now we with full right reported two enemy submarines were sunk. There is material evidence I, with satisfaction, signed award lists for orders and medals to our modest heroes officers and sailors of minesweepers. By the way, at Babanov it was not the first victory. On August 26th, 1941, the hydrographic ship Nord disappeared. The commander of the Kara base captain first rank, SV, Kazelev sent airplanes and one of the best minesweepers in the base TSH-116 Babanov to search for it.
several days of fruitless search for the missing ship continued. And on September 5th, in the morning, sailors found a submarine near Mon Island. Babanov opened fire from multi-barrel bombometers. After the fourth salvo boat went down, various objects floated up. Soon divers arrived and found on the ground German boat U-362 with five large holes in the hull. Among the sailors who were honoured with a high government award was a young man from the minesweeper TSH-116 Volodya Kotkin. I handed him a newly established medal Yushikov in memory of the outstanding Russian admiral, who glorified in the 18th century our fleet in naval battles in the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. This medal was especially popular among our sailors. Many wanted to earn it. And here it was on the chest of 15-year-old Volodya, a universal favourite of the ship. In spite of his young age, he fulfilled his duties to match a long-experienced sailor. A signalman by specialty, he always performed his duty correctly. His eyes were sharp, and more than once he was the first to detect the periscope of an enemy submarine. In addition, he was an excellent horn player, considered indispensable in this role. The military council of the flotilla has always paid special attention to the juniors, their service and education. It is understandable if we take into account that many of these guys lost their parents during the war. We considered it our duty to put them on their feet. Ship commanders and political officers treated young sailors with paternal care. And thanks to this, most of our pupils, as they say, went out to the people. Volodya Kotkin finished the war with three medals on his chest, then his trace was lost. And not so long ago, already in 1971, I read a note about him in the newspaper. It turns out that after the war Vladimir Andreevich Kotkin graduated from the Kharkov Communications School, then from the Leningrad Electromechanical College, and has been working for many years as a senior site foreman at the plant Volna in Novgorod. His name is in the Book of Honour of the Enterprise. He was awarded a medal of the All-Union Exhibition of Economic Achievements. His work is interesting. He often goes on business trips. And not only in our country, but also visited France, Sweden and Yugoslavia. I would like to say to him, well done, young man, keep it up. Hitler's command understood the importance of the northern sea route, especially during the war. From the Arctic ports we transported by sea the Pecora coal, from Amdama ore, from Yenisei and Orbi, also various national economic cargoes, so necessary for the country. The strategic importance of this route was also great it connected us with the Far East, with the Pacific Fleet, from which we received ships. Once at a regular operational meeting, the head of intelligence flotilla Captain Two Rank and Sidorov warned that we should expect increased activity of Nazi submarines in the Arctic. Judge for yourself. On all fronts the fascists are beaten, they are retreating. And more than 30 boats have gathered in northern Norway. For what purpose? Obviously for action in our north. Yes, the enemy's activity is increasing in our zone. In 1942, Nazi boats in the flotilla zone appeared 99 times, the next year 198, in the current year has been noted already 300 cases of detection of the underwater enemy. There was something to think about. The head of the operational department of the flotilla headquarters, Captain First Rank NF, Bogoslavsky said. I agree with the Chief of Intelligence. In our zone will pass this year 350 convoys, most of them the Arctic route. Undoubtedly, the enemy will spare no effort to strike us here, and not only by submarine attacks, but also by mine laying. According to our data, he has already put in our zone more than 300 mines. Bogoslavsky came to the map and showed me the areas littered with Nazi mines. All of them were in front of the entrance to the White Sea, on the approaches to our bases and straits. The trawlers of the flotilla were continuously trawling the fairways, their crews behaved heroically. I want to make special mention of TSH-109 of Senior Lieutenant Y.S. Velichko and TSH-110 of Senior Lieutenant V.V. Mikhailin. Mikhailin. We sent them on the most important missions to check the fairways and to escort convoys. V.V. Mikhailin in 1943 passed with the trawl more than 4,000 miles, destroying many dozens of mines and led about 60 transports. These figures speak for themselves. Mikhailin's crew acted just as valiantly in 1944. TSH-110 was awarded the Order of the Red Banner. 
As for the number of convoys, we were wrong in our calculations. In 1944, not 350 but 487 convoys came to the White Sea, which totaled about 1,000 transports. Taking into account that in the light season, in the polar day, the Allies refrained from sending convoys, the Nazis in the summer of 1944 threw the main forces on our Arctic communications. Only in the Kara Sea constantly operated seven German submarines. But by that time we received new ships and could now significantly increase the escort up to three or four warships for each protected object, and in special cases and more. Hydroplanes. Catalina, received from the Allies, made long-range reconnaissance throughout the theatre. Before the passage of convoys they searched for submarines, as well as floating mines, storms derailed from their anchors. Before the exit of convoys we now more and more often made a decisive clearing of. The necessary areas from the Nazi submarines, sending here large forces of aviation and patrol ships. In addition, the convoys included so-called strike groups of ships, which had one goal to seek and destroy the enemy. This tactical technique has fully justified itself. Now the escort ships were not for a minute distracted from their wards' transports. The results did not slow down. Losses of transport stopped. The Nazis had to change tactics. Having made sure that direct attacks of convoys became more and more difficult and risky, Hitlerites switched their boats to laying mines, ordered to attack our radio stations and observation posts serving navigation in the Arctic. In the flotilla area of such posts, located sometimes on uninhabited islands, were more than 200, and of course we did not have the forces to ensure a reliable defence of each of them. One morning at the end of September, Captain 1st Rank Krasnoselsky, the Chief of Communications of the Flotilla, and Captain 2nd Rank Golosin, who was in charge of anti-submarine defence issues in the headquarters, came to me. Both of them looked anxious. Your comrade commander said Krasnoselsky, the observation and communication post at Cape Stelagova, transmitting a weather report, urgently asks to urgently report the locations of convoys. Something is not right here. I invite Bogoarpov. Let's look at the map. Cape Stelagova is located in the Kara Sea, east of Mikhailov Peninsula. The post has certain tasks. Why does it need information about convoys? Our battery is on the Mikhailov Peninsula. From it to the post is more than a hundred kilometres. It's probably inexpedient to send sailors from it. They'll get there one day. The chief of staff suggests not to answer anything at the post and the commander of the Kara naval base to give instructions to send a ship to Cape Sterligov. So we did. In these days, a convoy with four transports was to go in the Kara Sea. For 24 hours, the radio of Cape Sterligov persistently asked about its movement. We were silent. In the evening of September 26th, an authorised representative of Glavs of Morput on Dixon reported that Sterligov's radio did not answer any more requests from Dixon. The commander of the Kara naval base ordered all batteries and observation posts in the Kara Sea to increase vigilance. There was no doubt something had happened at the radio station. The mystery was revealed before the ship sent there approached the Cape. The chief of the radio station Bukhtiarov himself reported about what had happened. The case was as follows. On September 24th, he and the sailor Signal and Agaev on a dog sled went to inspect the coast whether there were no mines thrown out by waves and any objects from the lost ships. In the evening he returned to the station and was suddenly captured by fascists. It turned out that Hitlerites from two submarines landed a landing party of 25 machine gunners and seized the station. The winterers, except for two watchmen, were asleep. By force of arms, the fascists forced the radio operator of Glavs of Morput to transmit all radiograms according to our schedule and, in addition, to request data on the movement of convoys. Submarines for secrecy lay on the ground in a neighbouring bay. Found Bukhtiarov Hitlerites brought to the station and began to interrogate. The sailor preferred to die than to give away a military secret. He long bickered with the interpreter Russian White Guard, often repeated, stalling time, scrutinised the situation. Finally, having found a convenient moment, Bokhtiarov fled. Knowing the terrain well, he three days he waded through the tundra, until, completely exhausted, did not reach a neighbouring post, passing about a hundred kilometres. The Nazis, in a wild rage, crushed the station, 
took prisoners with them and returned to the submarines. They never learned anything about the movement of convoys in the Kara Sea, only forced us to change all the code tables of communication. The repaired station was soon back in operation. As it is known, during the war we received food, armament, military materials from our allies on Lend-Lease. A large cargo flow from America and England went, as I have already said, through Arkhangelsk and Murmansk. Foreign naval missions were established to organise this business and solve many issues related to the stay of foreign sailors with us. Since the British Admiralty was in charge of the convoy service, the British mission in Arkhangelsk was headed by an officer of the rank of Commodore. In Poliani at the headquarters of the Northern Fleet, there was the same naval mission, but it was always headed by an admiral. He was subordinate to the head of the British naval mission in Moscow. Such was the system of leadership of the Allied convoy service in the north. The flotilla headquarters maintained daily communication with the officers of the mission, together with them solved the issues of unloading ships, supplying them with fuel and food. Before the convoy went to sea, a conference of ship captains was held, at which, in the presence of mission representatives, the flotilla headquarters informed everyone about the situation at sea, reported the courses of the convoy's movement in our zone, as well as familiarised with the composition of the escort forces allocated by the flotilla, the order of mutual communication. Captains of ships asked a lot of different questions, which were immediately answered. We worked amicably, with full understanding. British and American officers from the mission sailed a lot, well versed in maritime affairs, seeing what sacrifices our country is suffering in the war, how heroically the Soviet people are fighting, British and American sailors treated us with due respect. They sincerely wished for a speedy defeat of the common enemy. On the occasion of our successes on the land front or at sea, the head of the mission commodore usually came to me with a storm of congratulations. We responded in kind. Once at one of the receptions at the mission, I asked the Commodore about the ill-fated convoy RQ-17. The Commodore shuddered and remained silent. I realised that it was difficult for a former sailor, who himself had commanded large convoys, to speak on the subject. And I have long been interested in this sad story. In 1942 I served in Moscow. As an assistant to the chief of the main naval staff, and took part in solving the issues of convoy service in the north. And now we learned that on June 27th, a convoy with the letter RQ-17 left Iceland for Murmansk, consisting of 37 transports in the immediate protection of 25 ships. The convoy, in addition, had a powerful operational cover of two detachments, which included two battleships, one aircraft carrier, six cruisers, 17 destroyers, a whole curtain of nine submarines. Cover more than enough. Given that in the northern fjords of Norway was only one Nazi battleship, three heavy cruisers and twelve destroyers. We closely followed the movement of the convoy. The Northern Fleet and the White Sea Flotilla, in order to cover it, deployed their submarines and light forces, as well as prepared aircraft to search for and destroy enemy U-boats. From the intercepted telegrams we knew that the Nazis conducted several air attacks on the convoy, but all of them were repulsed. There were no losses in the ships. This, of course, encouraged us. And suddenly we learned that on July 4th, without warning the Soviet command, the Admiralty ordered the British. Escort ships to leave the convoy and urgently go to join the main covering forces and transports to disperse and get to our ports independently, without any security. What's the matter? Moscow was astonished by this decision. The transports were carrying military cargoes, so necessary for us in those difficult days. And suddenly they were abandoned to their fate. There are no miracles in war. The enemy did not miss the opportunity, and 24 transports went down from the blows of his aircraft and submarines. After that, the British did not dare to send convoys to us for a long time. I repeated my question. Mr. Commodore, what is the explanation? I would like to know your opinion. The Commodore frowned even more. Finally, he spoke. Admiralty learned of the entry into the sea Nazi squadron led by the battleship Tirpitz. We could not risk our fleet. This decision was made by our admirals. I realise that I am dealing with a military officer who is not strong in diplomacy, and there is no point in torturing him with my questions. Many British sailors were ashamed of the behaviour of admirals from the Grand Fleet. 
1956, in London, published a book by Alistair Maclean's His Majesty's Ship Ulysses. The author writes, having received the order, the caravan cover detachment immediately separated to the west, abandoned the caravan to its fate. The feelings of merchant ship crews at this betrayal of warships for the sake of saving their own skin is easy to imagine. The Admiralty, of course, was aware of the significant superiority of its forces over the Nazi squadron, but did not want to risk large ships. Admiral N. M. Karlamov, my old friend and co-worker, was at that time the head of the Soviet naval mission in London. He told about his repeated conversations on this subject with the first Sea Lord Admiral Pound. However, even from him it was not possible to get an intelligible answer. We could not reconcile then with the requirement of the instructions developed by the British Admiralty at the slightest damage to the transport the crew must immediately abandon the ship. The transport abandoned by the crew was hastily sunk without trying to save the most valuable cargo. Thus, during the defeat of the convoy RQ-175 ships received minor damage that could be easily repaired. They were shot and sunk by their own escort ships. Planes, guns, hundreds of tons of ammunition went to the bottom of the sea and this during the hottest battles on the Soviet-German front. For 20 days, ships of the White Sea Flotilla and the Northern Fleet collected the surviving ships. Eleven transports were found and brought to Arkhangelsk. This was all that was left of the huge convoy. The crews of Soviet transports behaved differently. It is possible to write whole books about their heroism, about how they saved their ships. I remember one English captain, the senior in the group of transports, came to me with a visit and, remembering the fate of the convoy RQ-17, enthusiastically spoke about the courage of the sailors of the Soviet motor ship Azerbaijan. After the attack of fascist aviation, the ship caught fire and tilted. My friend, the commander of the English minesweeper, came to your ship to remove the crew, but the sailors refused to leave their ship. Soviet Captain Izatov replied to the minesweeper, I thank you for your help, but as long as the ship is afloat, we will not leave it. With the friendly efforts of the crew, the fire was extinguished, the roll was levelled, and Azerbaijan reached Novaya Zemlya at a slow speed, and then arrived in Arkhangelsk, having repelled several more enemy air attacks during the passage. Everyone thought Azerbaijan was lost, and suddenly it appeared in the port. British and American ships standing there greeted it with signals, congratulations, and cleanly done. Yes, it was. Our allies were amazed by the feat of Captain Vienne, Izatov and his subordinates, who at the risk of their lives extinguished fires, sealed the holes, defending their wounded ship. I'm going to Novaya Zemlya. I wanted to go there for a long time, but I couldn't make it, and now there is an urgent need. Captain First Rank AI, Dianov was assigned to the Pacific Ocean, and a new commander arrived at the Novaya Zemlya base. I wanted to see how he mastered the business to help. It is not always easy to command a unit after an officer of good fame. It requires great tact, a particularly sensitive approach to people, the ability to retain the style of his predecessor, to support and continue everything valuable in his work. At that time, there was no regular communication with Novaya Zemlya. People and cargoes were carried on transports under escort of warships, and only mail was delivered by airplanes. Captain Taran and Senior Lieutenant Kupchin were considered masters of flights in difficult Arctic conditions. But there was a large group of us we could not be accommodated on their small airplanes. We decided to fly on Catalina. This American-made twin-engine anti-submarine seaplane had good tactical and technical data speed 314 km per hour, range 3,600 km. It was armed with cannons, machine guns, 800 kg bombs, the airplane was equipped with radar. Now these data will seem modest, but at that time we rejoiced, having received an opportunity to replace our outdated single-engine MBR-2 with a large sea machine. Early September morning we arrived at the airfield. The vehicle was a combat vehicle, not designed for passengers, so there were few amenities for us. Major General Pavel Selevishtovich Gavrikov, the head of the rear of the flotilla, rather obese in stature, could hardly squeeze through the narrow hatches. I settled down on a mail sack not far from the navigator's table. Major General G.G. D. Zuba, commander of the aviation flotilla, sat down next to me. Accompanying us officers squatted wherever. 
loaded Catalina, humming engines sailed from the shore. A large lake served as an aquadrome. The car began to run up, all shuddering from the shocks of water. They were so strong that it seemed that the hull was about to be blown to pieces. The blows became more and more deafening. A flag flashed in the porthole, the border of the aquadrome, but the car still did not come off. General Duba frowned unhappily, but the blows stopped. Dizuba breathed a sigh of relief. Finally, he explained that the airplane is overloaded and there is no wind. That's why they took longer than necessary. Managed the machine deputy commander of the regiment experienced naval pilot Captain S.M. Rubin. At first everything went well, but the farther away the visibility became worse. Clouds gradually merged into a solid milky mass. The car began to shake like a cart on a bad road, and Dizuba, looking at the porthole, covered with a white veil, quite said. Good. Fascists will not find us in this mud. But we are flying without fighter cover. The airplane is cold. We're freshening up. The navigator reports that we're approaching Novaya Zemlya, however, still can't see anything. I ask Diuba. How are we going to land? Dizuba is unperturbed. Don't worry, Captain Rubin will land. The noise of the engines subsided. The airplane lowered its nose. I look at the altimeter. The arrow deviates to the left, past the Mark 200, and behind the porthole is still the same cotton candy. I see the commander of the plane turned and said something quietly to General Duba. He nodded in agreement. The faces of both are serious and stern. It turns out that the base commander reported that the bay was covered with fog. Captain Rubin made a bold decision to land in the open sea and then under the engines to turn into the bay. The altimeter arrow is already at zero. It's a little creepy. But here is a sharp blow, as if against something very hard, the airplane, it seemed, even cracked. Another bump, and then a sharp deceleration. Splashes of water were heard. We had landed after all. The engines were humming again. Faintly visible outlines of the shore appeared in the fog. With jerks bouncing, the plane skipped into the bay. Yes, not in vain everyone praises Pilot Reuben. A small boat approached the airplane. I shake hands with the new commander of the naval base, Captain First Rank DGG, Jakin. I've known him for a long time. He's a submariner. Courageous, judicious, indefatigable, besides inexhaustibly cheerful. Just the kind of people we need here in the far north. The headquarters and political department of the base were located in a one-story wooden house, very well and firmly planted on the high shore of the bay. The office of the base commander was cosy and warm. On the wall is a large map of Novaya Zemlya. Chief of Staff of the base, Captain First Rank PM, Razdabotko reports the situation. The area is large. Novaya Zemlya consists of two islands, separated by the Strait Matochkin Shah. The islands stretched for almost a thousand kilometers. They are up to 100 kilometers wide. On land, a complete lack of roads. Communication between garrisons only by sea. On Novaya Zemlya, there are many deep, well-sheltered bays, but at that time, not all of them were developed. And although our observation and communication posts were already placed in many places, including even the northernmost point of Novaya Zemlya, Cape Zelania, some of these bays until recently served as a shelter for fascist submarines. When our Novaya Zemlya base became stronger, the uninvited guests began to get hard. Enraged fascists increased attacks on our observation posts and radio stations, put mines in the Straits Matochkin Shah, Kara Gates, Yugoski Shah, on the approaches to Belushaya Bay. Now we are rich, and we can put out sentries to the most threatened areas, and there are more batteries on the coast. Jemekin told in detail about military affairs of sailors of the base. He is not only a good commander, he is also an inquisitive historian. In a short time he collected and generalized a lot of data about the development of Novaya Zemlya, its indigenous population Nenets, about the heroism of the defenders of the distant region of our country. I already knew some of this from the stories of the first commander of the Novaya Zemlya base, A.I. Dianov. For example, how on the second or third day after the arrival of our sailors in Belushia Bay, 
two fascist submarines came here. They felt at ease here, surfaced without any precautions, and came under fire of our ships. Hastily the fascists dived under the water and barely got away. Other visits of enemy ships ended more sadly for them. This is evidenced by the marks on the map of the base commander black circles with crosses. Here is one of such circles north of Cape Zelania. In 1942, the Nazi heavy cruiser Admiral Scheer snuck into the Kara Sea. He tried to destroy the port of Dixon, but was prevented by the icebreaker steamer Sibirakov and our battery on the shore. Weakly armed Sibiryakov, of course, could not do serious damage to the armor giant, but still fought to the last. The shore battery fought just as steadfastly. Several of its shells reached the target. The fascist raider could not withstand and retreated. Our sailors thought how could such a large ship penetrate the Kara Sea unnoticed. The straits are controlled by our posts. There was only one way left north of Cape Solania. Our submarines began to be sent here. Submariners disliked this position sailing conditions were difficult, all the time among ice, and not a single enemy vessel was encountered during the whole trip. At the beginning of August 1943, the submarine S-101 came here. It was commanded by Captain Lieutenant E.I. Trofimov. It was the first trip of the young commander, and that's why he was accompanied by an experienced mentor, the commander of the division Captain 3rd Rank P.I. Egorov who had previously commanded this very ship. For a week, another third week, the submariners sailed the sea nothing and nobody. And the crew of the boat is a combatant, on the account of more than one sunk enemy ship. The fruitlessness of the search began to piss some people off. But Igorov remained calm and urged everyone to patience and endurance. Persistence brought success. On the 18th day, acoustician Komsomolitz Larin heard the noise of propellers. The commander raised the periscope. A snow charge came, visibility worsened, but still Trofimov saw the silhouette of a German submarine. It was coming from the Kara Sea to the north in a surface position. Taking into account the seriousness of the moment, Igorov took command of the ship. He managed to stealthily approach the enemy and release torpedoes. What happened was something that does not happen very often. All three torpedoes fired hit the boat. The Nazi ship was blown to pieces. At the place of the Nazi boat's destruction, our submariners saw a huge stain of solarium in which floated various debris, scraps of clothing. Sailors picked up a signal book, diary of the boat commander and other very valuable documents. From them, it became known that it was a large submarine U-639. She was returning from the mouth of the Obi River, where she had placed barrage mines. Near the eastern shore of Novaya Zemlya, the fascist boat sank a completely defenceless hydrographic ship, Akademik Shokalski. People floating on the water, Hitlerites savagely shot from machine guns. Assumptions that fascist ships penetrate into the Kara Sea, rounding Novaya Zemlya from the north, were completely confirmed. It was only regrettable that we sent only one submarine into the 200-mile strip of clear water between the island and the ice edge, without taking into account the tricky nature frequent fogs and snowstorms. Our submariners were alarmed by the fact that the Nazi submarine went not to the west to the Norwegian skerries, but to the north. Unfortunately, this secret was revealed after the war. It turns out that the Nazis in 1942 secretly founded a base for their boats in Cambridge Strait, on Franz Josef Land. Here the boats operating in the Kara Sea recharged their batteries, were repaired, their crews rested, and before going to sea received the latest intelligence about the situation. Alas, we could not find this base in time, although the area of the Franz Josef Land Islands was repeatedly visited by our ships and airplanes. In war, there were such things.